Hello everyone and welcome to Political Paradigm. I'm Terry Ikumi. The conversations ahead of the elections continue. Today my guest is the Director of Publicity and Advocacy of the Northern Elders Forum, Dr. Hakim Baba Ahmed. Welcome to Political Paradigm, Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. You're most welcome. Uh, I mean, we're counting weeks now to the elections. And uh, yes, we will talk about the endorsement of the Northern Elders Forum. But are you as excited as some Nigerians, especially the new voters, that we would have a new president? Yeah, well, I'm excited that we're having a different, a new president after President Buhari's eight years, uh, which haven't been exactly a success. Um, it's a chance for renewal. These elections represent a massive, massive potential for Nigeria to move in a different trajectory. Mm -hmm. Potential. Um, they represent an opportunity to um, allow 75% of the voters decide who is going to be president. They give millions and millions of young Nigerians a chance to participate in deciding who should um, be part of making the future better or worse. So I'm excited. Uh, I'm also uh, very worried over whether we will get that person, um, who it will be, uh, and whether they really understand just the state of the country as it is now. Whether they have the ideas in their heads of what to do, they're willing to hit the ground running, and they're preparing to take on the burden of leading Africa's largest nation, largest democracy, potentially the second largest democracy in the world. A huge young population that is frustrated, alienated, angry, all these things. I need we, so it's a, it's a little bit my excitement that we are going to have a chance to renew the country through leadership. It's tampered by concerns that we may not have the kind of people who will meet those standards. But look, we, it's, it's already a done deal. We have 18 Nigerians out of whom we have to make a choice. And uh, we, we uh, in the Northern Elders Forum, we watch, we're studying the candidates, uh, we're evaluating them. And uh, we are hoping that eventually, uh, we and other Nigerians will make the right choice in terms of who has the greatest potential to offer the kind of leadership we're looking for? Well, we'll talk about that in a short while, but I understand that you are not comfortable with the kind of conversations that are holding, especially among the front runners. It would seem that you fear that this could degenerate into a security concern ahead of the elections. I'm not. I'm not comfortable. Uh, that's putting it mildly. I'm very disappointed, and I'm sure I'm not alone. When you hear, when you see spokespersons of presidential candidates use language um, and, and behavior that would just simply, is intended to throw muck in the face of the opposition, you say, okay, that's part of politics. But when you see candidates hurl insults against each other, and make horrible allegations against each other, people who are going to be our presidents, one of these candidates who are exchanging horrible insults and abuse is going to end up being our president. What is that, what do their conduct say to young Nigerians? That it's okay to do these things? Um, they, they, uh, they inflame passions. They justify politics as a dirty game. Um, they behave like the people they should not be behaving like. They have, they're not setting standards for people. They are not showing qualities of leadership that they should be showing. To convince Nigerians that, well, maybe he said this about my father. Maybe they said this, that I'm a thief. Maybe they've said this. But there are ways in which this can be handled in a manner that suggests that you can be both responsible and political. But we're not seeing that. And that is what is disappointing about it. Um, they, I think the candidates themselves have run out of ideas. They've run out of Maybe they've shown us our manifesto, they've shown us our programs. Maybe they have understated or they haven't understood this long five month campaign period. They've run out of ideas, now they're falling back to the staple, the normal staple of politics. Insults and abuses. But these insults and abuses uh, inflame an already charged atmosphere. And it's potential for 
triggering unrest, particularly among young people, is great. So it's disappointing. How, how is that affecting the decision of the Northern Elders Forum on who to support? Well, uh, as I said, we have a long paradigm of judgment. Um, we, we, we look at candidates, we look at their programs, their manifestos, what they say in rallies, what they say in media outings. Um, what, we look at the people around them. And we look at this kind of breakthrough brats. We look at them as well. We judge the people, them. What we're looking for is a Nigerian president who is going to become responsible enough to lead a nation in distress. Um, and the Northern Elders Forum frowns on this because it's not part of what, it, the, what you require to be a leader. We, we obviously, we will score them low in that regard. And uh, with the time that is left, if we have opportunities, we'll say to them, listen, uh, don't get carried away. You, as president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, you'll be the number one citizen in this country. Um, everything you do, everything you say, has to show that you're seriously concerned about setting examples and standards. And your personal conduct must be above board. And for the Northern Endless Forum, this is a major issue. You know, uh, some months ago, last year, the Northern Elders Forum held a town hall with these uh, political uh, uh, ca presidential candidates. And the purpose for that was to ascertain what exactly the North specifically would gain from whomever, whoever becomes president. Does it bother you that the other regions have not done that? Instead, what we've seen have been, has been endorsements one from one or two notable persons in the other regions. Does it bother you that these kinds of engagements have not been held by leaders uh, collectively in the other regions? Well, look, let's be fair. Every, every region, every group has to take a decision on its own. Um, uh, after the Kaduna Joint, Iowa Joint Committee, uh, which was tremendously successful, I, we, we suspected that it would be difficult to replicate it again for a number of reasons. Um, the North is more cohesive. Uh, and, and, and let me remind you that if this was not just the Northern Endless Forum, it was a, a joint collaboration of six groups, six critical groups in the North, which came together and said, let's get, all the can let's get some of the candidates and interrogate them in public. So, um, in spite of the plurality and diversity of the North, in political terms, we have more cohesiveness. So we could, we could do that. Um, the, the rest of the, the, uh, the other regions uh, were, were left with the choice. Try to ape that, and you will get candidates who say, mm, we just, Kaduna, I'm not sure that we want to do this again. And Kaduna wasn't exactly a soft uh, landing for many. It, it was tough. We, we put the candidate through some really rigorous and challenging questions. So, and they rushed to endorsements. Uh, maybe some candidates, maybe some regions felt coming out to say, this is our candidate. He is a, the person to, to, to go for, has his advantage because you identify your interests early enough. Uh, we haven't done that. Um, and it's deliberate. We don't want to rush to, into judgment. Um, we have a pretty good idea of the uh, criteria we are applying in judging who, should, who we would advise Northerners to vote for. Um, we have a pretty clear idea at this stage um, what two or three people uh, we think are likely to deserve our support. And so it's a, um, I, can't, I can't judge the action of other candidates, uh, other regions. Yeah, but, but, but you say that it shows that the North has better cohesion than the rest of the region, than the other regions, Me too. politically. I think, I think we are also a little bit more sophisticated in political thinking. Um, why, 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 for instance, would the North go out and simply endorse an ethnic, a candidate that 
has a huge stamp of ethnicity or that he comes from our region. Buhari comes from the north. The north has, has never been worse than it is. We know, we know, we now know why, how, how damaging it is to narrow things down to he is one of us or he comes from our region. We know that. We're looking for quality. And if we find it, we'll say this is the person. We, uh, if other people feel uh, being, we, we fought a battle with the rest of the country over even whether a Northern I should contest. And we won that battle. Remember this time this year, North Southern governors, all 17 of them from APC, from PDP, from APCA, would gather in one place and send threats and say no party should give any Northerner a platform, etiquette. No Northerner should contest. The presidency must come to the South. And we fought that battle simply by saying, show us where it says that the law says that no Northerner can contest. No party should give a ticket. And we, we won that battle. We won it because it was the right thing. You can't stop a Nigerian from aspiring to be a Nigerian president. Constitution identifies the qualifications and identifies what it requires to be. If your party feels you and you happen to be in the North, uh, from the North or from the South, it's up to the voter to decide. So we won that battle. And we didn't do it for a Northerner. We did it because the principle that every Nigerian must participate in the selection, in the election of their leaders is sacrosanct. You cannot uh, uh, hijack it for political reasons. So we've done, we've done well. We've also done the Kaduna thing. And we've, we think that our strategy for following these candidates, evaluating them, um, uh, assessing them, and, uh, and holding back uh, and not being stampeded or intimidated by the choices that others have made. It's the best strategy. Well, for some, it's taken too long. And uh, I'm sure you've heard this before. There are those who say uh, that the endorsement of the Northern Elders Forum may amount to nothing, especially because in 2019, you did not support President Muhammad Buhari, yet he won in the North. Uh, so how would you react to concerns that the Northern Elders Forum's uh, support for a particular candidate may not yield much? I would say, let's wait and see. Um, at this stage, we are comfortable with what we're doing. Um, and we are fortunate that uh, substantial portions of the North understand what we're doing. And they understand the value of um, being cautious. They understand the value of uh, rigorous assessment, evaluation of candidates. And uh, nobody, the pressures are not, is not coming from the North. It's coming from people who have already endorsed someone and who are saying, who's your candidate? And we're saying at this stage, everybody is our candidate. And the candidates go everywhere in the North. Uh, out of the 18 candidates, five are Northerners. And as far as we know, there is no hindrance to anybody coming to the North to say, vote for me. And that's great. And, and we want the Northern candidates to have the same access all over the place. It's, uh, it's, we have five weeks. We're not panicking. Uh, if there are people who want us to endorse someone now, I'm afraid they will be disappointed. We know what we're doing. What we're doing is the right thing. Um, and there are many ways in which you can endorse a candidate. We don't need to, to follow the pattern of someone else. We can chart our own course. And that's what we're doing now. And we're very, very comfortable with what we're doing. If people think that uh, Northern Elders Forum is relevant, we'll just say, okay, let's wait and see. We know who we are. You know, you're a strong critic of President Muhammad Buhari. You've been open about that. I'd like to know from you if your criticism is restricted to the president or perhaps the APC in general. I think it's both. I was a member of the APC. I was chairman of the, of the party for three, four years in my state in Kaduna. And I participated actively in the election of President Buhari in 2015. 
The basic, the basis for these criticisms is basically that President Buhari is, uh, has failed. He has failed to live up to the expectations of Nigerians. He hasn't fought corruption. He hasn't fought insecurity. He hasn't fixed the economy. Um, and rather than say, look, keep quiet about it. He's, not, he's one of us. Uh, and we were part of electing him. I, I, I and uh, other members of the forum decided that we said no. We, he may be a northerner, but for goodness sake, he's uh, creating more problems for the northerners of him. Look at where we are now. When he became president, only the South is had knew of IDPs. We didn't know what IDP was in most other parts of the North. Today you have IDPs all over the place, in their millions. The entire economy of the North is gone. Who is supposed to be responsible for this? Someone is responsible. People can't go to their farms to, to harvest the yield this year. Same thing last year. Somebody must be held responsible for this. So our criticism of President Buhari was not based on anything other than simply an evaluation of his performance. And he, he hasn't done well. Uh, look at the mess that, that is going on. Even a few days to his leaving, CBN debacle. All these things you hear about, money is borrowed, these things about CBN. And the president is still maintaining this aloof, aloofness, this, this uh, hands-off approach to governance. And what you see is a lot of drift, a lot of uh, non-governing. You cannot treat this country as complex and as, as uh, burden-ridden like Nigeria, and not have people criticizing him. But it's nothing to do with him. It's, it's just simply a reflection of his performance. So if you tie the performance of the president to the All Progressives Congress, would the Northern Elders Forum still give consideration to the APC ahead of the elections? It's interesting you ask that, because I asked uh, Asiwa Jibola Tinubu, I was allowed only one question in Kaduna, and I asked him, the president, President Buhari's record, especially in the North, hasn't been very good. You're one of the legacy, one of the liabilities, because you're going to step in his shoes, APC candidate, and you're going to convince Northerners to elect for elect you to continue as APC. One of the problems you would have is that you will inherit his liabilities. Tell tell us in the North what you will do different from what he has done. And how can you hide and how you can reduce this liability? His response was interesting. He said, Well, I am a Tinubu and he's a, he's a Buhari. Um, he has his own ways of doing things. And I will do my own ways. In fairness to him, he also said, President Buhari has done well. And I will build on those things. But that's what we expect to hear from any politician. You can't denounce a president who has, still has considerable power to decide whether you, you win an election or not. We didn't expect anything from that. But APC, for me, APC has to do a lot of work to clean up its table. Uh, the eight years they've been in power hasn't been particularly outstanding. If they are going to say to Nigeria, trust us with power, we're going to do a lot different. They have to say in more specific terms what it is they will do. Um, how, how are you going to fight the security challenges that emerged under your watch of as a party? Um, and who is going to be your governors? We are not just looking at candidates. We are looking at gubernatorial candidates as well. The quality of them. Because governors are very important. We are looking at the kind of people they will be sending to the National Assembly. So we're assessing them comprehensively and uh, totally. We're looking at people at potential gov governments, legislative and executive. Um, and, and so the challenge for APC, I think, will be what to do with the legacy of President Biden, which is not particularly uh, inspiring. You're familiar with what's happened in the past weeks and how the candidates have been going to Chatham House, including the INEC 
chairman himself. And some Nigerians are not comfortable with that. They don't see the need going all the way to London to speak to Nigerians over an election that will be held in Nigeria. Where do you stand on that? I stand with Nigerians who think this is contemptuous. This is irresponsible because you spend a huge amount of your money, our money, whoever's money going to London to speak to us because you're certainly not speaking to British people. The British people are not interested in what you plan to do in Nigeria. And uh, it, it's also demeaning. It demeans the country. It demeans you, who is likely to be the president of the country, that you had to take a whole bunch of Nigerians to go to, to a, 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 one small think tank. I use the word small, not in terms of capacity, but it, uh, you have no business going out of the country just simply to impress us. Impress us here. This is where the action is. Tell us what you're going to do about joblessness. Tell us what you're going to do about uh, 50 million young people who have no hope. They, they are going to, they're not going to school, or if they are going to school, it's not worth any, any going there. They, they don't have no jobs. Even if they go to school, they graduate and there's nothing. Tell us what you plan to do about this population barge. How do, what do you intend to do? What do you intend to do about Kano? Are you going to talk to him? Are you going to negotiate with him? All the bandits and the, uh, the other criminals, what do you plan to do with them? Talk to us here. Tell us. But when you go out, out of this country to a place because someone else is gone, it shows clearly that you're not thinking the way we think. You're not impressing anybody because you've gone to Chatham House. Anybody can go to Chatham House. Anybody. And I really mean it. And I don't want, again, I don't want to be disrespectful of Chatham House. But there's, it's not a big deal. In fact, what it represents is, is that you, you don't think much about Nigeria and Nigerians. And uh, when you become president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, is that, is that going to be a reflection of how you conduct foreign policy in, in relation with other countries? What, what do foreign countries have to do with us? What, do we, what does a foreign think tank forum they provide, just a forum. What do they have to do with this election? So if there are Nigerians who are worried about this, I'm one of them. I wish they hadn't done it. I know we don't have an influence over them. They will do it. They will find other avenues to go out. Maybe it gives them an opportunity to rest for two or three days. In anticipation of the endorsement of the Northern Elders Forum, the Muslim-Muslim ticket conversation has resurfaced. And now there are concerns as to whether or not that would be a factor in the decision of the Northern Elders Forum. The North is made up of Muslims and Christians. Religion is an extremely sensitive issue in the North, as it is in the South. But in the North, more sensitive, because it's one of the major fault lines. Uh, it has triggered a lot of conflict, unnecessary conflict, because it doesn't have to be an issue. Um, the Muslim Muslim ticket is a deliberate choice by the APC candidate, um, and he will live with the consequences of that. We can see some of it. He has alienated some elements of the northern population, the Christian elements, substantial. Um, and uh, maybe it's based on a calculation. But what we do know is that no Christian, no Nigerian Christian, no Northern Christian or Northern Muslim will fight over the ticket because, uh, for or against, because their faith will be favored. If Tinubu becomes president, Islam is not necessarily going to be treated better than Christianity simply because both him and his deputy are Muslims. If he becomes president, the Northern Christian is not going to be better or worse because Chinubu and his deputy are, uh, are both Muslims. We can't, we won't allow our faith to be used for, a, a, for patently partisan interests. And we know our commitment to our faith is stronger than this. So it's, there's a lot of politics involved in this. Uh, but what we do know is that uh, we will not fight over faith. Uh, so it's not a factor in the decision-making process of no, the Northern Elders Forum. it's not. But are you not concerned about the unity of the country? I say this because 
political analysts and some concerned, some citizens have raised concerns about the level of divisiveness in the country as it stands now, and then saying further that a Muslim Muslim ticket, if it turns out to be a winning ticket, may further raise the agitations in the different regions. Look, no one can become president of this country unless they are voted in accordance with the rules and the law. They are voted by a majority of Nigerians. They must have 25, they must win 25% of the votes in at least 24 states. Then they must get the majority of the local votes cast. Anybody who becomes president would have had massive votes from Christians and from Muslims. You cannot become president if all the Muslims in this country line up behind you. You can't. Because you won't get the requirement. You can't lose an election because all the Christians have lined up against you. You can't. So this, this tendency to say, uh, uh, if he wins, if he wins, it will be because uh, Christians and Muslims have voted for him. So where does all this Muslim Muslim ticket uh, emerge emerge from? If the Muslim Christian ticket wins, it's, it's because Muslims and Christians have voted for it. So it, it really is irrelevant. But in the calculation of uh, uh, the, the APC, they see it as a vote winner. But no matter what you think of it, the ultimate decision, judgment for that decision is how Nigerians vote. And that's why we say, at, at all costs, you must allow a credible election to take place. Whoever wins this election must have won it without doubt, transparently, the records should show you won it clean, free and fair. That's, that's the best way to solve all these arguments. You know, in one of your weekly articles, you said that it would be difficult for the Labour Party presidential candidate, Peter Albi, to emerge victorious in the elections due to what you describe as uh, him battling titans, Atiku and Tinubu. And I recall having a conversation with uh, Professor Angwa Abdullahi, who said something similar. Uh, it would almost be impossible for him to win an election of this magnitude. And some would want to interpret this to me, that the Northern Elders Forum may not be looking in that direction, since he already holds these positions. No, I think, I think to be fair to both Professor Angwa and me, um, you, you asked us a question about his prospects for being elected. And the response is, we look at Nigeria, we look at the Labour Party, we look at Obi as a candidate and Deti as his. Um, and we look at where they stand in relation to all the competitions and the, the problems that they will have to face. To win an election for them would involve the same requirement for Atiku and Tinubu to win an election. That means votes, votes, real votes, have been cast to, to give you 25% of the votes in 24 states, and to give you the absolute majority of local votes cast. Currently, he's facing an object, um, uh, 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 he's facing the problem of dealing with two huge parties that have massive resources and support in many parts of the world, in many parts of Nigeria. He's got to reduce that support they have and treat tilted in his direction. That's going to take a lot of resources. That's going to take a lot of mobilization, uh, money, and, uh, and, and, and marketing. Then uh, uh, you have people who will mobilize for you because they are also contested. He doesn't have as many people, yet, uh, candidates for state assemblies, uh, federal House of Reps, Senators, Governors, as APC and PDP have. They don't. Uh, he doesn't have that. And that's a critical requirement. Now, those are the, what is called the structures, the party persons, party officials, candidates. Uh, but Labour Party keeps saying uh, the people is the structure. And so when Professor Ango and I say, uh, his challenges are more, more profound than theirs, is because somehow they don't appear to be paying attention to grassroots mobilization. 
you need to mobilize voters. You need to go to Zamfara and say, if you elect me, Peter Obi, I will do better than Atiku and Tinubu because I understand your problems. And these are my people in Zamfara. This is my office. These are the people who are going to run for the office. They can go to Gombe and sell themselves. Now, rallies are not necessarily indicators of popularity. Anybody can do a rally. So when we make comments about Labour Party, it's not because we don't like them. And it's not because we've already taken a decision that we would not support them. We just simply, I, I interpret your question in terms of why do we say that Peter Obi has a more difficult challenge than, say, Achiku? And then go for it to ask whether you would consider, consider supporting a candidate with that kind of challenge. Well, why not? Um, we're not? We're not just supporting someone who has the best chance of winning. Chance of winning. We are, we are, support, we are looking for a candidate who is the best out of all of them. And what, when we say the best, we mean in character, in, in, in background, in what we see as a preparedness to lead a country. We're also looking at the kind of uh, government he's going to form. Because no one single person can transform this country. You need a whole team. Who are the people who will work with you and for you? What are, what are the kind of the strategies you have to make sure that when you, are, when you have power, you have some control or some a good relationship with the legislature. People say things like, oh, don't worry about uh, Peter. If he becomes president, everybody will defect and join the Labour Party. And sometimes I think that's a bit simplistic. It's a Nigerian thing, isn't it? It's a Nigerian mm -hmm. thing, and it is a distinct possibility. But another distinct possibility it, you can have him become president, and then the legislators and other people that you think will run to him would sit back because it's, it, they, they also have a lot of power and a lot of clout. And, and they may not necessarily defect. The people who would be in the House of Representatives and in the Senate and governors would be from the APC and PDP. They will ask does it pay us more to join the Labour Party to leave our tickets? Or does it pay us more to get him to do what we want? Are you saying that you don't see the Labour Party winning good numbers in the House of Representatives and the Senate? I'm looking at the numbers of people they even have who will contest. But you do realize that there have been defections from either both of these parties to the Labour Party as well. Yeah, yeah. Look, the, the, who is going to be your candidate or not is sealed. From INEC now, you can get a picture of how many people the uh, Labour Party has across the country who run for state assemblies, who run for federal house of reps, um, except for a few that are still being litigated, who, who will be senators, uh, governors. Look at the quality of the people who will be governors. Um, do they stand a good chance of becoming governors as opposed to the APC and PDP's candidates? Um, all the, you have to put all those factors on the table and, and decide. But we are not going to decide uh, purely on the basis of who has the best chance of becoming president. You could have the best chance of becoming president, but you may not have the best chance of becoming the best president or the right president. And we're looking for the right person. A lot of mutations, a lot of assumptions are being made. Okay, even if he doesn't have the people now, he's likely to get them. Mm -hmm. But we're worried about a situation where the post-election, we want a president who will hit the ground running, who is prepared right now, if he gets elected, to begin governance. Where does uh, Senator Rabi Musakwankwaso come in all these? I couldn't help but notice that when you were talking about Titans, he wasn't mentioned. I also recall that he declined the invitation of the Northern Elders Forum. What does he come? Well, he Elders? declined the invitation because he said it was rigged in favor of a candidate. And he was wrong because it was never rigged. It was never intended to favor anybody. We said so before the forum itself. We said so after. And to date, Northern Elders Forum has not endorsed anybody. 
So it was wrong there. Where he doesn't feature is because, like I said, we've been monitoring all these things. If you ask me to list three, the top three contenders, to be Obi, uh, Chiku, and, and, and yeah. Tinubu, and, and there is a basis for that. Uh, perception, understanding, evidence on the ground. Maybe he will pull a, a surprise and surprise everybody and become the dark horse. Who knows? But we're talking about what looks like the three front runners. Um, he thinks he has the chance, which is good. Um, he should be in the race. Is he part of your consideration as well? All candidates, all the candidates are part of our consideration. But I'm concerned. I mean, why would you endorse someone who's declined? your invitation. He hasn't told the North what, it, what he would offer the North. So why is he still part of your consideration? Oh, he has told the North what he would offer. He's released the just manifesto. Just not on your platform. It just didn't come to our platform. We hold no grievances or grudges against him. We think it was an excellent opportunity for him to have come. He didn't come. We don't have any grudges or problems with him not coming. Um, and we don't have a problem with him as a northern northerner aspiring, asking for Nigerians to trust him. We don't have any problem with Congress. If he becomes, if, if he if he fits our um, judgment in terms of being the best, we will stand by him. What are the North specifically wants from the next president? We want a Nigerian president first. A Nigerian a person, irrespective of where you come from, irrespective of your faith, who would be elected because majority of Nigerians feel he understands the situations of Nigeria and, and can fix it. Then we want, we want a, a president who understands the problems of the North and has a program that he can, he can begin to implement from day one. We want uh, a president that the North can have access to, who will pick the best from the North and from the rest of Nigeria and work with them. And we want a president who would really deal with insecurity, build our infrastructure, address the issue of out of school children, address social problems that are existing, and reintegrate, re reinvent Nigeria, allow Nigerians, facilitate a system that will allow Nigerians to be Nigerians, not Igbo and Hausa and Fulani. We want to president that will rediscover that Nigerianness and, and, and allow us. We want a Nigerian president who would allow us to discuss the country. Um, whatever, restructuring, dialogue, anything, anything. There's nothing wrong with that. And we want a Nigerian who would deal with the issue of banditry and kidnapping and Boko Haram. Those are the things we're looking for. You know, there are concerns as to whether the average northerner has that kind of knowledge in making, it, uh, making his decision. I recall recently that uh, Senator Rabbi Kwank also tweeted that the north doesn't trust the southeast because of the IPO vegetations there, and the north wants a united Nigeria. Do you think that on that basis, the north will have a challenge voting for the, anyone from the southeast? Again, uh, so far, it's only Obi we're talking about. So why don't we talk? He's not the, the only South Eastern now on the ballot. You know that, right? He's not. He's not. Ah, okay. Yeah, but he's the only one that is. He's the most prominent one. He's a front runner. Okay. So he's the he's the elephant in the room. Why don't we? Why don't we ask the question directly? <laughs> Will a northerner vote for Peter Obi? That's what you want to ask. Yes. Why not? Why not? But uh, the concerns you said the average northerner. Um, they are that, the average Nodai is very sophisticated. Um, and the average Nodai is very knowledgeable. He will choose what is right for him, like mm -hmm. everybody else. And if he doesn't think that uh, issues like IPOP, IPOP should have been, the fire of IPOP should have been put out as evidence that um, the South is, anybody from the South is serious about asking Nigerians for his mandate. Uh, people, when I say this, people say, why don't you say the same thing about Atiku and Tinubu and Yenzi? And I'm saying the stakes are higher for somebody from the Southeast. Somebody like Obi. 
if if the South is the population of the South is entirely supporting him, Igbo elite is supporting him, we ought to see a serious de-escalation of activities of IPOB. If nothing else, just to show that he can actually put out reduce the level of exposure. Because that everybody has a primary constituency. Whether you like it or not, his primary constituency is the Southeast. So that's why it's important. When I say this, it's not necessarily to say that, um, like some people say, call out Achiku over Boko Haram. Yeah, so I, I, I was also going to draw your attention to the agitation in the Southwest as well. Do you think that applies to the APC presidential candidate? Let me just say this. The more people play the ethnic card, the more everybody has an ethnic identity. If, if you keep harping on this view that uh, he is ours, he is Igbo, he is ours, he is Yoruba, he is ours, all you're going to do is to trigger he is ours because he's from the north, either his house of Fulani or whatever. That's all you're going to do. And people will line up eventually behind people the same way that you will line up behind yours. And we don't want that. Believe me, this country doesn't want an ethnic president. They don't want a president elected on the basis of his faith. We want a president who, who would be voted in because Nigeria, enough Nigerians feel comfortable enough and confident enough that he will actually fix the problems of this country. So we are receding, we are retreating. Where we are now is very dangerous. All this endorsement on the basis of faith and on the basis of ethnicity is very damaging. It's not moving the country forward. It's just simply taking us back, 1964. Long before the military came in. We have a very, very good understanding of history. We've broken a lot of bridges that shouldn't be there. The North is just beginning to talk to the Southeast. Mm -hmm. Right now, I can say this to you. However, there is a discussion going on between uh, northern groups and uh, Ohani's a and group. And we don't know where it will end. But it's good that we're even talking. What's the basis for a dialogue? Well, because we, we, we have to build, rebuild bridges. We have to build bridges. Some of it is political. Some of it is looking at what this country will be. The consequences of the elections are mm. very important. We're not just going to elect someone. This election is more than an election. It's a, it's, a, it's a referendum on Nigeria. So where are the responsible people are? Where are they? You must look at the build up to the elections and say, what is wrong? Don't do this. You must look at the conduct of the elections themselves. Between the two elections, what happens? Will some people cause trouble because in the first election their candidate hasn't won? And therefore, they will raise they will raise hell over the second election. Uh, you have to ask a question: um, What happens if you have a president and you, there's a lot of dispute over uh, over the, the the fact that it's not your candidate? So, talking at this stage at the level of elites and elders is very useful. If all we do is to say, "Look, let's allow the electoral process to produce the next president." Let's put as little hindrance as possible. Let's lower security, the insecurity threshold. Let's talk to each other. Let Nigerians see an Igbo leadership and the Northern Elders from leadership talking to each other. So that the huge numbers of Northerners in the South East can say, oh, okay, so we can have an election without necessarily having to die in the, after it. And then the Northern, the Southeast, Southeasterners living in the North can have some comfort that yeah, this, is, this is not a war. This is an election. So th th those are some of the values of, of, of this discussion. And I think it's a good thing that is taking place. And there's, there's another forum which has representatives from Afeni Ferry, from Panda, from Mohanes Indigo, from ACF, from Northern Elders Forum. This afternoon, after this interview, we're going to meet with the Peace Committee. These are people, prominent Nigerians, who said, listen, somebody has got to look after Nigeria. And that's the compatriots. So everybody is looking after ethnic groups, but who's looking after the country?
another tweet from Senator Abdi Musa Kwankosu said that the elections would be free and fair if all stakeholders, especially the president, wants a free and fair election. The president has repeatedly said that he's given INEC all the freedom it requires, all the funding as well, and has promised a free, fair and credible process of free, fair and credible elections in 2023. With a statement from Senator Abiy Musa Kwankwaso and what the president has said, does the president's body language and statement suggest to you that indeed he wants a free and fair election in 2023? I think the president's understanding of uh, allowing INEC, uh, allowing I mean, credibility of the election is narrow, it's too narrow. He's limiting it to, I'm not going to interfere in INEC's processes. I'm not going to decide, I'm not going to help to rig an election. I've given them everything they needed, and I'm not interfering in anything, even within his party, relatively aloof. So I think he defines his definition of, um, I'm going to support a credible election. It's too narrow. A credible election will not take place unless you radically improve the security environment. As we speak, huge numbers of communities are under the influence of non-state actors who can determine whether people come out to vote or not. Huge numbers in the southeast, in the northeast, in the northwest. A large number of people. And these non-state actors can actually have a major impact on turnout. What are you doing about that? You cannot approach the election with the assets and the resources that you have and imagine that everything will fall in place. There will be places where people will threaten anybody who goes out to vote for an election. There will be places where people can't venture out to go. There are places where INA cannot deploy personnel and, uh, and, and material. If the president is really serious about having a credible election, it be, goes beyond non-interference non and funding INA. It also involves improving the access to the electoral process by all Nigerians and allowing a peaceful environment where our votes will count and people will agree over who wins. I'm afraid in that area, he doesn't appear to be doing well. At this stage, at this stage, it's like something there is to go. I'm hoping he doesn't have to reveal all these plans. I'm hoping that they are looking very critically at areas where the nation is vulnerable in terms of the election radically improving the quality of the security they are, provide, they are going to provide around election time, dealing with election violence, monitoring threats that are likely to arise for this, and then for, for us in the North, raising, raising uh, the level of security around communities. They want to vote. A lot of the people who are under influence of bandits and kidnappers who are afraid of them have cards. They want to vote. On the 25th of February, what kind of condition will you create that would allow them to actually go out and vote in peace and security and come back? Those are basic questions, and they are many. In Kasena, in his own state, in Kaduna, in Naji state, in Zamfara, in Sokoto, there are communities, there are communities where people can't vote. So for me, I define I see his role in, in, in a wider context than he is defining it. He thinks just not telling Einig, give him the leadership, um, or oh, this is what I want, it's enough. It's saying, give them all the money they ask, is enough. It isn't. You've got to secure the electoral environment and secure sufficiently. And right now, I'm not too sure. We are spread too thin in terms of our security assets. And I hope that they have a plan for boosting it tremendously, dealing with the Southeast, it will I cover an, allow an election? Maybe the first one, will they allow the, first, the second one if Peter Obi doesn't win? Um, would Boko, what, what is going to happen in Borno and Niobe with Boko Haram? What, what is, what's, what are, how do we deal with bandits and kidnappers who are already preventing farmers from going to their farms? Would they also say, we don't want you to go and, and vote? I'm not exaggerating. These are realities we live with every day in the North. So, if the president wants credible elections, he must go beyond 
non-interference with INEC as well as funding. Those issues are factually settled. Dr. Babam, I have followed your write-ups and uh, recently you wrote about a possible reader, a possible runoff, second ballot in the presidential election. And it's interesting that we're having this conversation now. It's not something that we're used to, at least compared to past elections, is it? It's, we've never had it. Um, and we shouldn't have it now. I'm telling you, if, if you look at all the scenarios that are possible, that is one of the worst case scenarios. A runoff? Yep. The politicians will tell you, oh, no, 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 we don't need it. We will win outright. Most of the leading parties will tell you. But it is a distinct possibility uh, that none of the candidates gets 23, 25% in 24 states. Um, and therefore, you don't have uh, the, the other requirement, which is the up to absolute winner. That's why every run is provided for, to be a contest between just two, the two leading candidates. If that happens, um, then all the cleavages and the fault lines will come into play. We, I, we're going to become more ethnicized, we're going to, religion will play a more decisive role. Um, and as you know, runoffs are decided by on such simple majority. Politicians are exploiting very dangerous terrains and deepening them, religion, the ethnicism. If you have a runoff, they will be even more pronounced. Uh, my personal perception, or my personal feeling is that they will, this will be a very serious challenge to our security. Uh, but it is there, and it's there for a good reason. All right, just before we go, uh, you talk about the need for the North to vote based on what they will benefit from a candidate. So let me ask you this question as we wrap up. Uh, are you proud of how the North has voted in the past elections? And what will change if not? As I said, the Northern voter is, is actually quite informed. People think uh, the Northern voter is like sheep. People just follow leader. It's not. Um, if you look at the uh, electoral history in the North, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. We have never voted just together. Even when Buhari won, which I think was the highest point where the North voted for a candidate. This opposition also got the same 25% in 24 states. So, um, yes. Uh, the northern voter will vote for his interest like everybody else. We've made mistakes in the past. We've chosen people who were not the best. But listen, our political process doesn't always throw up the best. In fact, our political process discourages the best from emerging. That's one of the sad elements about this. And we know. And no matter how much you want good leadership, it has to be people with the money, who will emerge and get the tickets. So you choose from people who are tremendously rich or who had somebody's money to contest. <clears throat> you can't go out of that. Look, the people who in primaries for governorship, to Senate, have, would have spent millions or billions. And it's the same all over the country. So the Northerners are going to make decisions uh, that are severely restricted from people who are either products of the old system, substantially, or if you who want to come into the system. It's, and, and, and it's the system we have to change, the system where a few people recognize politics as a major avenue to acquire funds and resources, basically. And they are all over this country. We tell people now, don't vote for parties. Vote for good candidates at all levels, at all levels. This way you reduce the tendency to just simply send uh, people who just see politics as a business uh, for their pockets. But I think that the North eventually will take the right decision. And I can assure you that we will be in there with them. We will, we will do what is right for Nigeria and for the, and whoever emerges. The North asks three things. He must be 
product of a credible election. He must, every part of Nigeria must accept that whoever wins this election has won, and those who have lost should accept that they have lost. And we must support him or her because they are going to lead this country through a very difficult time of re-engineering and regeneration. It's very important. If we fight each other because we, didn't, we don't like who emerges. But, but what's to say that this position is not taken by uh, just the educated population in the North? Is this message being passed down to the uneducated population in the North? And how is it being passed down? Because we know the religious and traditional influence of the leaders of the North. We have many ways of talking to people, many, many. But I can tell you one thing, there is substantial convergence by Northerners now on the need to be very careful about who we elect. But when we do agree on who it is, we will owe nobody any apology because we will be exercising the same right everybody else is exercising. We would say, this is the person that we think will serve the interests of Nigeria and the North, and he should be supported. And we will not apologize for that. Dr. Hakim Babamed, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, that's Political Paradigm, everyone. Do well to catch this episode and previous ones. Simply go to YouTube and search Political Paradigm or go to channelstv.com. The elections are almost here, but you have your PVC yet. Remember, you're voting based on whom you believe is the best candidate, not who you expect to win. I'm Terry Kumi. Goodbye.